I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're diving into the intriguing world of Australia's ancient river systems with Dr. Ann Jensen's captivating book, Murray Darling Mysteries, Nature's Unique Strategies for Survival in the Murray and Darling Rivers in Australia. Right now, we're going to explore the secrets of survival in one of the world's oldest and most variable ecosystems, where the battle between drought and flood shapes all life. Join us right now as we unravel the mysteries of nature's resilience and adaptability in the face of climate extremes. We're delighted to have this very talented author join us here today at Spotlight. We thank the team over at Prime 7 Media for helping us put her in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like her by subscribing to our channel and by purchasing her important book. The links are below this interview. Doctor, great to see you here today on Spotlight. Thanks, Logan. Your book does a great job of highlighting the Murray Darling Basin's age and evolutionary history. How do these ancient origins affect the current biodiversity and the ecosystem strategies that we see today? Oh, what we see today is the result of all those uh, millions of years of evolution first in creating the physical characteristics of the river basin and then as the plants and animals have adapted to that. And, and the key, as you said, is that it's, it's hugely variable. It's never the same twice. And those plants and animals have worked out how to live with that. Mm. Now, the basin is a boom or bust ecosystem. Explain to us how the extreme conditions have shaped the unique survival strategies for its uh, flora and fauna? So what we see is um, we'll get a series of wet years, um, even flood years, and then a, a, a period of drought. And how do you live when there's too much water or not enough water? How do you figure out a strategy for that? And so that's what the plants and animals have done, and they've all got different ways of dealing with it. So uh, with the trees, uh, many of the trees that we see today are hundreds of years old. So they evolved long before European settlers arrived and started changing the system. And so they have wor worked out that if you store up the water in the wet times to so make sure it's got down into the root zones, it's stored in the, the plants themselves. And then in the dry times, they just, they close down, they, they stop producing seed, they only put out a few flowers, um, just enough to keep surviving. Mm. And then when the floods come around again, then we get millions of seedlings that will generate. Uh, and so that's where the next generations come from. Are there lessons for humanity here uh, as we tend to be dealing more and more with climate extremes? Well, the, the big lesson is not to take all the water in the wet times. We need to leave enough. Uh, we actually need the environment to, to get wet in the wet times. Um, when European settlers came here, they came from areas with permanent water and they were rather dismayed that the rivers here would run dry in summer. So they set about trying to make them permanent and to capture all the water behind dams and in and to store it so they could then release it when they wanted it. But that process has ended up leaving the rivers dry. Mm. And so that's, um, that's been a, one of the big issues for us is that over time we've managed to take too much water out of the system and not leave enough for the survival of the plants and the animals that um, really need to be able to be wet in the wet times. And we've lost that along the way. The majestic river red gums play a significant role in your book. Can you tell us a little bit about the importance of these trees to the river ecosystem and the challenges that they're facing right now? Yes, um, these amazing trees are what define the landscapes of the rivers and, and people going to visit, uh, the tourists and the people who live there. It's it's just there in the background as part of their, their landscapes and showing that the rivers are healthy. And you've got trees that some of them are, are many hundreds of years old. I know some, I think, are at least 900 years old. Uh, mm. So they've been there for a very long time. And they, we call them nature's boarding house because 
they provide food and shelter for so many other species as well. And they're all part of the, the life cycle. So, for example, one of those trees is, is thought to produce around about 600,000 seeds every year, seeds that are only the size of a pinhead. Hmm. But most of those will go for, as food for, <laughs> for ants and other insects. And we really only need a few of them to survive to be new trees for the new generations. So it's quite an amazing food source that's there available for, for the other species around. And then the shelter for, for birds, for insects. Goannas live in the trees mm. or, or find their food in the trees. They live on the ground but climb the trees, amazingly. Uh, so it's all interwoven. And, and one of the things that um, perhaps Europeans coming into this ancient landscape didn't understand was how closely everything is interwoven and how much of an impact we could have by diverting the water as we've done. Yeah. And now in the book, you discuss the critical role of water flows as the maestro of the ecosystem. Tell us how we can better manage these flows to ensure the health of the river systems and the change in climate conditions. So uh, what we need to do is to understand what are the, the critical patterns in those flows mm. to, to really to understand the score that the maestro is trying to follow. Mm. Um, and it's a good way to describe it is a bit like Goldilocks. The plants and animals need the, the right amount of water, the right time, the right quality for the right length of time in order to suit their patterns for regeneration and breeding. And that's what we've interrupted because it, it is a highly variable pattern. It's not as predictable as we would like. Humans, for some reason, need everything to be very predictable um, and repeated patterns, right. whereas nature, and particularly in the Murray-Darling Basin, is so unpredictable and, and varied. And uh, so, you know, for example, we had a very large flood last year the biggest one since, second biggest one since European settlement. And all the journalists wrote it was unprecedented. Mm. Well, in fact, it was precedented. We knew it was coming. We'd seen the evidence of big floods like that before, and it was inevitable that it would happen again. But um, humans seem to be on a, a pattern of they want regularity and very short time frames, so that they tend not to remember as well. Um, so we're, we've been out of sync with the, the native patterns in our yeah. basin and, and understanding them should help us to manage a bit better. Yeah, I guess we humans try to control the environment um, and the conditions um, for survival reasons. Uh, but the road to heck is sometimes paved with good intentions, particularly when it comes to our ecosystem. The impact of European settlements and uh, the agricultural practices on the Murray-Darling rivers is great, as you mentioned. Are there any key steps needed to restore and maintain the health of the rivers for, you know, future generations? Well, we have invested a lot of time and uh, research into understanding these patterns. We have a, a great body of experienced scientists who've worked on the rivers for many years and we are getting much better at understanding that. Uh, we've also got um, now legislation trying to correct what we need to do. Um, part, a part of the issue is getting the general community to understand how important it is and to have them understand just what it is that we need to do to keep both the rivers alive and then the communities that depend on them alive. Is that part of the reason why you wrote this book? Who's your intended audience? Um, absolutely. What I'm trying to do is bridge the gap between the scientists who understand the detail and the general community who perhaps don't see how important it is to all of us to get this right because uh, the river ecosystems have been in decline for decades now and alarm bells have been sounded by the scientists without really being heard. And so um, I'm hoping that by telling the story in this way, 
that more people will understand just how important it is to leave enough water in the rivers to keep them flowing, to keep them healthy enough so that we can go on uh, with our river communities drawing their drinking water and the irrigation communities growing food and um, very important um, products for all of us. But that can't happen if the rivers continue to decline and continue to have serious problems. Absolutely. Well, this book is a great wake-up call that is written by Dr. Ann Jensen. It is called Murray Darling Mysteries, Nature's Unique Strategies for Survival in the Murray and Darling Rivers in Australia. It explores the secrets of survival in one of the world's oldest and most variable ecosystems where the battle between drought and flood shapes all life. It's an amazing book. It's a profound book. It's a book that will help you understand the world we live in a little bit better. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you, Logan. My pleasure. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight. <laughs>